We left off last video with this question. Are these two statements saying the same thing? Now, it's not obvious if you look at it, and that's what we really need to figure out. So in this video, we're going to focus on stylistic variants. Stylistic variants are just alternate ways to express a logical connective so that we don't always have to sound like a robot. So we don't always say, it is not the case that blah, 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 or if this occurs, then this will occur, because rarely do we actually speak like that in real life. So stylistic variants are tied to each logical connective, and we're going to go through each one and just get to know some of the most common ways of expressing that connective. This isn't an exhaustive list, but you'll get the idea and get better at identifying stylistic variants of all the connectives as we move forward. The first one is actually the most straightforward, that's negation. There's lots of ways to say negation, like not, won't, doesn't, etc. Uh, and you're probably just already naturally familiar with how to negate something, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the negation stylistic variants. I will say be careful of opposites. A lot of people think that opposites somehow uh, work with negation perfectly, but not everything in the world, as many of us now know, are binary. So if I say someone didn't win, it doesn't necessarily mean they lost, for example. Uh, we just have to be a bit careful about thinking that everything is binary when we apply negation. Uh, in a test situation, I would never try and deliberately trick you on anything like this. So that's not something you need to worry about. This is more just uh, about using negation, logically speaking, in regular life. The conjunction is a really important connective because it turns out that it has the most stylistic variants. In fact, as we proceed, you'll sort of realize that if you're not sure what a connective is because you don't recognize it as a stylistic variant, odds are it's a conjunction. Um, almost all the stylistic variants of things end up being an and. So here's just a list, but moreover, although, even though, etc., etc. There's a lot of them, and we will sort of get to know a lot of these just by practicing symbolization questions. Here's some stylistic variants for the disjunction. Either or, on the other hand, else, otherwise, and unless. Now, a couple of these are a bit problematic, and so we're going to actually zero in and spend a bit of time understanding two of them. The first one is either or. Now, you might think that either or means something different than just or, but I've just told you that either or is a stylistic variant of the disjunction, which means they mean the same thing. So why is it that I'm telling you that they actually are the same and they're not distinct? Well, the difference seems to hinge on the understanding of something called inclusive versus exclusive or. So here are two sentences that we can take a look at. One says, bring your driver's license or your passport. The other says, you can fly to Montreal or Ottawa. Now, these are disjunctions, both of them. They both are or statements, but they seem to have a different meaning behind them. In the first one, it says, bring your driver's license or your passport. If someone told me that and I showed up with both my driver's license and my passport, they wouldn't get upset. It doesn't seem that I've misunderstood the instruction. They'd take both and be like, great. But if I was buying an airline ticket and the person said, you can fly to Montreal or Ottawa, and I said, great, I'll fly to both, meaning that I'll fly to both right now at the exact same time, uh, they would say, sorry, you don't understand. You can't do that. You have to pick one or the other. The difference is in inclusive and exclusive. Sometimes we think that or is inclusive, meaning you can do both sides of the disjunction and that would be acceptable. And sometimes we think or is exclusive, meaning you cannot do both, you have to pick one or the other. And so here it's natural for us to think that the driver's license passport example is inclusive and the Montreal Ottawa example is exclusive. But the question is why? Why do we think that the first example is inclusive and why do we think that the second example is exclusive? You know, what is it about these statements that is informing the inclusive or exclusive nature of the disjunction? So here's another example. Suppose you're at a restaurant and they say, you can have fries or salad. Do we know if this is an inclusive or an exclusive or? A lot of us might naturally just think that this is exclusive. You've got to pick one. But some of us have asked in our lifetime, can I have a bit of both? And then they say, yes. And clearly this is the better option. It's way better to have a bit of both than just one or the other, or at least I think so. So how do we know if something is inclusive or exclusive? It seems to be that we need a bit of context. We need a bit of background knowledge. In fact, what really motivated us to know that I had to pick Montreal or Ottawa 
was the knowledge that you cannot go to Montreal and Ottawa at the exact same time. They are in different locations. And so that is external knowledge. It's external to the pure logical nature of the statement. So when I put it that way, you should realize that the disjunction or is actually always inclusive. And what I mean is the logical nature of or itself is that it allows that both outcomes can be true at the same time. And this is because the logical nature of or is perfectly independent of the background or external factors of the statements it's modifying. And so for this course, and for all logic really, or is always inclusive. The disjunction is always inclusive. And that's a really important thing to remember. Now I haven't really answered then what makes either or also inclusive. Now, this can be debatable. You could run into some people who will insist that either is explicitly in invoking the, an exclusive nature of or. And I'd be okay with that. But I just don't want to complicate things for us. We're just going to say that either doesn't make any difference. It's just a stylized way to go. So when I say either or, you still want to treat it as an inclusive or. And one way to motivate that is in my first example of you can fly to Montreal or Ottawa, we all thought that was an exclusive or, and notice there was no either in that statement. So exclusivity doesn't depend on adding the word either. Either is just something you toss in uh, here or there. Similarly, someone could say, you can have either fries or salad, and you can still might ask, oh, can I have both? And they still might say, sure. And you wouldn't say, oh, sorry, you, you misunderstand the meaning of either or, you must be confused. No, that's not the case. So for these reasons, I'm going to just insist that either or is just a natural stylistic variant of the disjunction, uh, and the disjunction is always inclusive. The other complicated stylistic variant of the disjunction is unless. Now we use unless statements all the time, but it might surprise you to have me say that unless just means or. And so I'm going to actually have to try and prove that to you uh, in an example. So here's an example. Uh, you can imagine some doctor or surgeon saying, they'll die unless we operate. So this is sort of outlining some potential outcomes. And the question is, what are the potential outcomes? What are the potential combinations being uh, examined here about dying and operating? Uh, so we can take a look, and there seem to be four possible combinations. It's possible that the doctor will operate and the patient dies. It's possible that the operation occurs and the patient lives. The other two possibilities are where we don't operate. They don't operate and the patient dies and they don't operate and the patient lives. So when I say they'll die unless we operate, what do I really mean? Well, one way of understanding this is to ask which of these possible outcomes are possible and which of these possible outcomes are impossible under the assumption that the statement they'll die unless we operate is true. So we're just going to assume that it's true. Uh, the question is, what does it mean? Well, let's look at the first one. If I say they'll die unless we operate, is it possible that we operate and the patient still dies? If I say they'll die unless we operate, are we making a promise that operation will be a success? Actually, when you think of it that way, uh, we're not really making that promise. It is certainly possible that the operation will occur and it doesn't go well and the patient dies. We're not promising that that's impossible. That is actually a possible outcome. Now, the second one is actually very straightforward. If I say they'll die unless we operate, is it possible that we operate and the patient lives? Surely that's possible. In fact, that's the most hoped outcome of the set. Uh, and that's sort of the intended sort of meaning behind um, the statement in a lot of ways. Now, what about the next one? If I don't operate and the patient dies, is that a possibility given the statement they die unless we operate? Uh, surely that's also a possibility. In fact, that is strongly implied by the statement. But these types of implications, we don't really care about logically. I'm just sort of trying to suggest that you actually already know this intuitively. You know what possible outcomes are, are good and what outcomes uh, are impossible. Now, the only one that seems to be impossible, given that I'm assuming the statement they'll die unless we operate is true, is this. If I don't operate, then the patient still somehow lives. That seems to be not a possible outcome under the assumption that the first statement is true. 
So let's get away from some of this. We can just sort of symbolize. We can now add the abbreviation scheme P, we operate, Q, they die. And then we can replace all these outcomes with just P's and Q's. And we can remember that what we're really trying to look at is P unless Q. So what I've shown you is that P unless Q has to allow three possible outcomes, P and Q, P and not Q, not P and Q, and it must disallow, forbid, the outcome not P and not Q. And so is there a logical connective out there that actually allows for three possibilities and rejects one? In fact, there is. There's lots of ways that we can express this. And so the ways are, if not P, then Q, if not Q, then P, and I'm going to also add in P or Q. I'm just sort of stating this. It's not that difficult to prove this. And the way we're going to do that is invoke a truth table. So let's take a truth table analysis. This is just a simplified truth table of our three possibilities. Not P, arrow Q, not Q, arrow P, and P or Q. And so we have our atomic letters P, Q. And remember, what we're trying to do is capture what we identified as the correct understanding of P unless Q, which is that it must allow for those three possibilities and reject the one possibility that we don't want, the one outcome that's impossible. So when we just fill out this truth table, those are my atomics, and then I fill it out, pretend I did a full truth table, or you can do this if you want, you can actually see that these are all the same. Not P, arrow Q, not Q, arrow P, and P or Q all give you the exact same truth value, and they all reject the one case that we really wanted to reject. So this is a bit surprising, because I'm telling you that unless just means or, and whenever you see unless, you could have just replaced it with the word or. So why did we use the word unless? Well, it's just a rhetorical device. Unless seems to have some sort of uh, important implication tied to it, but logically speaking, we don't care about rhetorical devices. We only care about the logical nature of the statement and the truth values of the atomics. So that's why we can just say, oh, we're just going to symbolize it as a disjunction. Of course, you can also symbolize it as the, the not P arrow Q or the not Q arrow P. This also gives us a little insight into what or really means. The logical and connective or, or disjunction, what does it really mean? It actually means this nice little catchphrase. We can understand a disjunction in terms of a negation and a conditional. So P or Q really just means if not one, then the other. So whenever you have some statement of if not one, then the other, really that just means or. And if you think about it, that must be the case. If P or Q is true, that means if one of them is false, the other must be true. And that's exactly what unless means. So here's our list of stylistic variants uh, for the disjunction. And we've covered the two complicated ones, either or or unless. Now, the disjunction and the conjunction are nice because they are binary connectives that the, the left disjunct and the right disjunct, they can sort of move back and forth. It doesn't really matter. But remember, the conditional is the hard one. And the conditional is the hard one because there is a front and a back, an antecedent and a consequent. And so what we need is we actually need stylistic variance for the antecedent, and we need stylistic variance for the consequent, so that we always know which way to symbolize a statement. So there's lots of ways of introducing or pointing to an antecedent of a conditional, if, assuming that, provided that, in the case that, given, whenever, on the condition. Now, I also have something here at the bottom that says causally prior. Sometimes we actually don't use words. We just imply that A, uh, a caused B, and then A would be the prior cause, and that's an antecedent. The consequent, there's also lots of ways to introduce. Then, will happen, will occur, is a consequent, must be the case, follows that. Now, we don't always have to have an introductory word for the antecedent as well as an introductory word for the consequent. So you're really looking for these markers. And when you see one of these words, immediately you know, oh, it's a conditional. And this stylistic variant is telling me that this part is the consequent, for example. And that's uh, sort of how we speak a lot of the time. The conditional is actually tricky for two bonus reasons. Uh, one reason is that we often swap the order of introduction in English. So we already know if I say something like if P then Q, that's very natural. It's P arrow Q, no problem. 
Uh, but another way we can speak is we can keep the P and the Q in their relative positions, but we can swap the order of introduction by using a sort of stylistic variant of the conditional. So I can say P if Q, and this is very common. And P if Q symbolizes as Q arrow P. So it's really important to remember that for a conditional, you need to spend an extra moment asking which is the antecedent and which is the consequent. Because it's not always the case that what comes first in the English is always going to be the antecedent, and what comes second in the English is always going to be the consequent. Actually, uh, the way that we speak in English, it can be all sorts of different ways. This is made even more complicated with the second issue, that we can actually swap the order of reference in English as well. So let's look at an example. If I have P provided that Q, uh, well, provided is a antecedent introduction phrase. So I know that it's pointing to something that is the antecedent. And here, it seems that what I'm pointing to is the Q. So no problem. I recognize that this is a conditional. I know that the Q is the antecedent. Immediately, I symbolize it Q arrow P. But if you look at this statement, P is provided then Q. You can see that I'm still using the word provided. And if you just assume, if you just remember or memorize that what comes after provided must be the antecedent, you would actually get this symbolization wrong. Because in English, we can swap the order or swap the direction of what we're referencing. So here, the provided condition is actually P. And so this symbolizes as P arrow Q. Now, this is going to be really confusing for uh, people who aren't native English speakers or English language learners, and you really need to look out for this. So what is really doing the work here isn't just the term provided. It's actually signifiers like that, provided that Q is pointing to the Q, and is provided then gives us some contextual clues. So be careful about the direction or the, the sort of pointing of some of these phrases, because sometimes it can point forward and sometimes it can point backwards. There are two really important stylistic variants for the conditional that we still have to get through, and those are necessary and sufficient conditions. So let's look at the first. If I say P is necessary for Q, what does that mean? Well, this is certainly a conditional statement, but what I need to know is, is this P arrow Q or is this Q arrow P? The best way to understand this is just to have some sort of toy example in your mind that you can always go back to. Uh, so my example is the statement, oxygen is necessary for fire, which is true. So here I have an abbreviation scheme, P, there is oxygen, and Q, there is fire. Now the question is, is it P arrow Q or Q arrow P? But now that I have this example, I can actually just write out the sentences as P arrow Q and Q arrow P. So if it's P arrow Q, I get the sentence, if there is oxygen, then there is fire. Otherwise, I would get the sentence, if there is fire, then there is oxygen. Now, one of these captures the meaning of oxygen is necessary for fire. And this, I'm hoping that this is naturally going to be intuitive to you once you see this example. Uh, and one of the options does not capture the meaning, and if true, would be really disastrously bad for the world. So if you take a look, it's got to be the case that the first one is, is not correct. If there is oxygen, then there is fire, because that means that I would be burning up in flames right now because there is oxygen. So a necessary condition here doesn't mean that if that condition appears, then the thing occurs. It's actually the other way around. And so if I say oxygen is necessary for fire, that means if there is fire, then there is oxygen. For sufficiency, we're going to do the same thing. Is it P arrow Q or Q arrow P? P is sufficient for Q. Well, here I have an example, and what's different about this example is it's not necessarily true, but let's just pretend it is. Uh, one sleeps, one feels rested. Sleeping is sufficient for feeling rested. So again, I'm going to do the same thing. If one sleeps, then one feels rested. If one feels rested, then one sleeps. And I ask intuitively to you, which of these do you think is the true understanding of the statement sleeping is sufficient for being rested? Uh, well, I hope that you see that it's the top version, if one sleeps, then one feels rested. Uh, because it turns out that sufficiency means there could be other ways for me to achieve that goal. I could feel rested for other reasons. Uh, I could meditate, for example. But I know that whenever 
I sleep, I will feel rested. And that's captured by P arrow Q. So I like having these toy examples in mind, but you could also just memorize what a necessary condition and what a sufficient condition really mean. A necessary condition is introducing a consequent, and a sufficient condition is introducing an antecedent of some conditional claim. OK, so the conditional, it's complicated. It's got a lot of things going on. Here's a list of a bunch of stylistic variants. Uh, but I also say that you got to know your necessary insufficiency. Watch out for those two warnings that I expressed. And I've added a bonus thing to this slide, which is the word only. Only is so difficult and annoying that we're going to dedicate a different video to it, and I'll come back to it soon. But only is a conditional stylistic variant. It just turns out it does it in sort of a complicated way. The stylistic variants of the biconditional aren't that exciting. Uh, if and only if, exactly in or exactly in the case that uh, is equivalent to, and I also have necessary and sufficient. If and only if is important to, for us to understand a bit closer, but notice that it contains the word only, so I'm not going to come back to that until uh, we actually dig a little bit deeper at what the word only means. Uh, necessary and sufficient, again, we'll come back to this as well uh, when we uh, take a slightly closer look at necessary and sufficient. Um, but for now, it should make sense that necessary and sufficient does in introduce the double arrow, the biconditional. I'm going to say that there's another possibility, and you do see this in some logic texts, which is just in case or just in the case. So I'd say P just in the case that uh, Q or X just in case Y. I actually really don't like just in case because it's a bit ambiguous. Sometimes people seem to think it means just a conditional. Sometimes people think it means a biconditional. So because it's actually hard to figure out, I'm just going to never, ever use it in my course. Uh, what actually determines whether or not it's a conditional or a biconditional is, is typically contextual factors, background knowledge, etc. And like I said previously, we don't want to be dealing with any of that background knowledge requirements in this course. We're strictly looking at the logical understanding, so you'll never see that moving forward. So in this video, we looked at the stylistic variance, but we did do some really important things. We understood the difference between inclusive and exclusive or, and unless, unless is an important one as well. And we see that a really important thing is being able to identify what's an antecedent and what's a consequent in a conditional. That will be the most difficult part of unit three. So coming up next, we will take a closer look at only to really understand and complete the understanding of our conditional statements. And we're going to look at three common phrases that just have uh, very important symbolizations just because they come up a lot.